the wooded hills of New England may appear completely untouched by man. Pristine. Ancient. But they are not. Stone walls and house foundations dot the landscape. But probably the most enigmatic of all historical remains are the mine tunnels carved into rock in isolated places. Forgotten, all but reclaimed by nature. Who were the men that came to take from this land what had lain buried for millennia? What did they hope to gain by such back-breaking work? Now, I will investigate one of these mysterious mines, nestled deep in a forest in Woodbury, Connecticut. A tunnel on the bank of a small stream. It certainly looks like it has been here forever. And someone put a lot of effort into driving it into the hard rock. Follow along as I attempt to unravel this little understood chapter of early American history. And uncover the secrets of the Woodbury Copper Mine. It was the fall of 2018 that Jeff Sherman showed me this small mine tunnel. Uh, my name is Jeff Sherman. I'm the vice chair of the Woodbury Conservation Commission. Um, in 2017, I was, this was um, Connecticut Trails Day. I was walking down the trolley bed trail and um, by accident, I walked down this trail and I stood here and I found that. I found the I, what I thought was a cave. I didn't know what it was. Um, so there was somebody with me who also came down and he got interested in it. And we walked up and um, we saw that there were drill holes, what appeared to be drill holes. Um, I'd also spoken to um, some uh, people who had been in town their whole lives and who grew up walking in these woods. And actually I spoke to a, a man who had um, been friendly with the person who sold this land to the town of Woodbury. And he said, oh yeah, there are copper mines up there. Um, but he didn't know exactly where they were. Um, he came down here um, and he looked at it and he said, yeah, that's probably one of them. I was intrigued. This is Michael Gerard, a caver and historian. The first thing he noticed was the mineral staining and crystals on the wall of the mine. But you can see there's a lot of iron. You can see the rusting all over inside of it. Seeing that, you know, a lot of time heavy metals are together, so they're figuring, okay, there's uh, iron in there. If we dig further, that green is going to turn out to be copper, and then it went nowhere. This might even be the, the vein, so we'll have to see what's back there to really see if it panned out. However, looking closer, we found no visible metallic ore. The floor was partially filled with loose rock. It could easily have been mistaken as a natural cave. You can clearly see the drill mark going down and ending right down there. But the drill marks in the ceiling and walls were definitive proof that the tunnel was created by drilling and blasting. But was this simply an exploratory tunnel? A gamble that never paid off? Or did these miners know exactly what they were looking for? If so, how did they know to look here? And what was it that they found and removed? 
I intend to answer these questions. There is only one logical place to begin my research. The Connecticut Museum of Mining and Mineral Science. Hi, I am John Pulusky. I'm the founder and director of the Connecticut Museum of Mining and Mineral Science. Uh, this is our 18th year of being open, and it's one of the most successful mineral museums in the area. We have the largest collection of Connecticut minerals on display in the state. What was Connecticut's place in the early history of mining in America? Connecticut was the cradle of America's mining industry. We had the first copper mine, the first tungsten mine, first bismuth, first cobalt, first nickel, first granite, first um, barite mine, first marble quarry, and I might have forgotten a few. Uh, but we got it started even though our ore reserves are very small. So we're very significant here in Connecticut. But who was the first person in America to begin a serious mining endeavor? Well, John Winthrop was one of my heroes in life. Uh, he was the father of America's mining industry. He got it started in the early 1600s by starting the first successful iron furnace in Braintree, Massachusetts, the second furnace in Saugus, Massachusetts, which is now a National Historic Site. He uh, wheeled and dealed with the Indians to obtain the graphite mine Tantanesk, um, which straddles the border between Sturbridge, Massachusetts and Stafford, Connecticut. John went on to um, finding the first gold east of the Mississippi in the town of Portland, the section we now call Cobalt. He and his slave mined gold there and created what's called the Governor's Ring. About 15 years ago, Dr. Phil Potts of the University of Connecticut uh, analyzed the gold and it assays out to about uh, 6 percent, and uh, it's found in the arsenal pyrite, uh, which is also found on the property. Um, unfortunately, I feel that the gold reserves are very small there. John might have also started the first uh, lead mine in Middletown, Connecticut. This became very important during the American Revolutionary War. John had the largest library of any in all of the colonies. Uh, he was an alchemist, an astronomer, and of course alchemy is really the forerunner of chemistry. So I'm sure he used his knowledge of alchemy to try to process ores. But Winthrop focused on gold and lead. The Woodbury mine was said to be a copper mine. So then what was the first copper mine in America? Well, there's a lot of lack of history. The, the next major group I feel would be the people that uh, discovered and started to mine the copper in um, East Granby, uh, which is now known as Newgate, Old Newgate Prison State Historic Site. Newgate, originally known as Simsbury Mine, was said to be the first chartered mine in America. It means that it was established under the laws of both the town and the colony and that had to go along with the blessings of the British government as well. Uh, the king controlled everything, including the forests and, and the minerals. But how was a group of Puritan farmers able to tunnel underground to remove the copper? What they usually did was to import miners from England, usually Cornwall or Wales, uh, to do the work. Uh, they had the knowledge and the skill sets necessary to not only mine, but also to, to smelt it down if needed. To get the rock itself, to mine it, you had to drill holes into the rock with hand steels, like a chisel, and a sledgehammer. Um, fill the holes with black powder and blast the rock into pieces. As muck it out or shovel it out, get it and grind it up and extract the main ore from the waste rock, the gang. Um, that was not an easy process early on. They just didn't have the, the knowledge and the chemistry to do that. But it was done, and uh, it was successful. There was a lot of waste. Most of the ore that was mined were copper sulfides. Um, calcocite is probably the primary ore. Uh, there were also sulfide ores, but those are more difficult to process early on. Um, uh, some of the other sulfides, like uh, calcopyrite, um, but they could do that, but it was, it was intense work. 
they'd have to grind it up, run it through a, a chemical process, and then try to smelt it down. So if copper was mined in Connecticut in colonial times, could the Woodbury mine be one of these colonial copper mines? I began scouring the records of the General Assembly of the Connecticut Colony, and visiting any mining-related sites I could find. The first mention of mining in Connecticut was at a meeting of the General Assembly on May 15, 1651 granting John Winthrop, Jr. mining rights to the entire colony. It was here that Winthrop was said to have mined gold and cast it into rings. And since colonial times, the hill high above this stream has been called the Governor's Ring. Could Woodbury Mine have been one of Winthrop's mines? It is unlikely. Drilling and blasting was not yet used at this time and there is no mention of him ever having prospected for minerals in Woodbury. The next mine mentioned in the colonial records was the Simsbury Mine in May of 1709. Today, the Simsbury Mine is a state museum called Old Newgate Prison because the mine was converted into a prison during the Revolutionary War. I met up with Morgan Bengal, who manages the museum, to explore the parts of the mine off the official tour route. So we're at Old Newgate Prison and Copper Mine, located in East Granby, Connecticut. Uh, this is uh, now operated as a museum run by the State Historic Preservation Office of Connecticut. Uh, and it's designated as a, as a National Historic Landmark and a uh, State Archaeological Preserve. The mining history is, is, is fat. I mean, it's it's why Newgate is here. So the miners, um, you know, dug the caverns, and that's why it turned into a prison. They were just they had the colonial mindset. They were just here to make money, and that's what they were trying to do. As I explored the mine, I thought about what I had read in the colonial records. It was this mine that would bring about many firsts for America. See, almost, almost every other rock or so has green staining on it. This copper deposit was bigger than anything before discovered in the colonies. No one single colonist would be capable of operating such a mine. It could only be accomplished with multiple investors and lots of capital. An act was passed by the Connecticut legislature to define the rights and responsibilities of the proprietors of the mine, set down when annual meetings would be held, and appoint three commissioners to settle differences between the proprietors and the operators. This was an early American version of the corporate legal structure so familiar today. The operators at Simsbury employed English and German miners who brought European underground mining and smelting technology. I can just imagine one of those miners over 300 years ago stacking these rocks to support the ceiling as they removed the ore from the mine. By 1721, the first copper smelting and refining works in America had been built at Simsbury. Another first in the New World was the proposed investment in education using the profits from the mine. One-tenth of the profits were to be set aside and divided, two-thirds for a schoolmaster in Simsbury, and one-third to be given to Yale College.
the Simsbury Mine was the first viable copper mine in the New World. But Simsbury was not an isolated occurrence. According to the records of the Connecticut General Assembly, in 1712, another copper deposit was found about 30 miles south in the town of Wallingford. By 1712, two of the investors in the Simsbury mine, William Partridge and Jonathan Belcher, took on a lease to mine the Wallingford deposit. In 1718, the regulations that applied to the Simsbury mine were adapted to the Wallingford mine, but were further revised and refined. It was called an act to promote the improvement of the copper mines within this colony. It helped ensure that those who would take the risk to invest in a copper mine would be regulated by commissioners to ensure fairness among all involved in the venture. I continued my research. I found an 18th century map that labeled the site as Sulphur Mine Mountain. Colonists would have known that sulfur is often found in association with valuable ores. And there it was, on October 4th, 1731, the discovery of a copper mine in Woodbury was recorded into the records of the General Assembly. Eight investors, Abram Worcester, Thomas Levingsworth, Nathan Wheeler, Samuel Beard, Daniel Curtis, Yelverton Perry, Joseph Worcester, and Josiah Perry had purchased the tract of land that contained the copper mine from John Creasy and John Sherman. They had petitioned the General Assembly to have their copper mine venture regulated by the same 1718 Act that the Simsbury and Wallingford mines were regulated under. Edmund Lewis, Joseph Minor, and William Preston were appointed as commissioners to the Woodbury mine. We now had the date and names, but there is no mention of what was found to compel the original eight investors to believe they had a profitable mine. To find out, we will need to uncover a sample of the ore they were extracting. The floor of the mine will need to be excavated to do so. Now there is nothing left to do but dig. It was late summer of 2019 that Jeff Sherman and I had our dig proposal approved by Inland Wetlands. Once all insurance requirements were in place, we began the project. There is a small stream just outside the entrance to the mine. Manually carrying buckets of dirt and rock across the stream would have been very time consuming and difficult. The material will need to be sent across the stream using a rope and pulley system. This is Steve and Felicia Millet from the Central Connecticut Grotto of the National Speleological Society. When it comes to underground exploration and rope work, there is no organization in the state that is more well equipped than the CCG. Start with simple, and if we need to make it more complicated later on, we can. But there's always room to make it more complicated. No. I mean, I've, I've been, I've been in there. You know, see what this picture looks like. Make sure that the colors. It's possible. You may not find exactly. This is Jim King, prospector and colonial history buff. This, this edit, my guess is, was walking height at one time. I don't believe that this is good. You're not going to find a floor that quickly. I believe they probably had this dug out a lot further than it is now, and it's filled in through the years. More sulfur up here. Iron and sulfur. Sulfur uh, is is very often associated with iron, and uh, there's probably calco. It might have been the calcopyrite, which is a type of iron sulfide that has uh, copper in it and gives it that gold color. 
he began to excavate the floor of the mine. When you're mining, you're looking for fluke, first off. You're looking for discrepancies in the rock. Like if, you're, if you see a bunch of rock like this right here, that's not very interesting. But as soon as you start seeing staining, there's some kind of mineral that's been dissolved and then redeposited right here. And I saw some greenish rock out there. Once you get that, that's an indicator rock and that means we dig here. Because it's so easy to dig anywhere and not find anything. But when you find an indicator rock and sulfur, iron staining, those things are indicator rocks. They usually mean something is in here. Take a good look. The material removed is deposited on a tarp where it is sifted and stored. Hay bales retain the material from washing into the stream in case of a major rainstorm or flood. few interesting finds are made, an old brass button, and the glass from a broken bottle. With the dig underway, I interviewed Susan Shepard, expert on local colonial history. Copper was tremendously valuable and it was like a copper fever going on. Uh, also, the colonies were obliged to supply things to the crown, and they sent annual reports of furs harvested, minerals harvested, lumber, absolutely everything, and you can go back and read them, and you can even read commentary where they were trying to kind of make excuses for um, iron ore had to be sent back to England and returned as finished iron which is crazy, and, but that's what they had to do. Because England was not about fostering a utopian New England. It was about commerce, yeah, and it was right. from the Mayflower onward, yeah. from Jamestown onward. Um, there was no real beneficence in that. And when Woodbury was settled out of Stratford, and they started actually staying a full year around 1672, they had to make money. Yeah. I mean, you can't live on congregational faith alone. <laughs> right. Yeah. And they were very vigilant for any opportunity. It seems that around the time the mine was being worked, a major shift in thinking was taking place in Connecticut. People were stopping viewing the wilderness as something to be conquered for God, the Puritan ethic. And the wilderness is something, hey, we can do stuff with this. <laughs> yeah. And um, the mercantile industry was very strong in Connecticut because of Long Island Sound, the Connecticut River, right. great shipping ports from the very beginning. And that also helped to fuel it. Right, like, right. You know, we really can be making money. And boy, money is cool. Except that Connecticut had no stable currency, so you wanted stuff. Gold, copper, iron, furs. But what would the miners have looked like? Leather breeches. Um, probably rough knit stockings because they did not wear pants. Um, probably a pretty frayed frock because they were going to go get dirty. Uh, gloves. Gloves were a big thing. Everybody had gloves and mittens. Um, hats. Um, 
probably pretty robust and muscular. Only the very, very upper class didn't do any work. Oh, they wouldn't have been refined at all. <laughs> <laughs> they would have been like construction workers and party guys and I don't mean in a bad sense, but they were just off to do a day's work. Hi ho, hi ho. Yeah. And I doubt they worked every day or even close to it. I don't think they took particular safety precautions because they didn't have anything to do it with. Um, you did yeah. what you had to do. Yeah. And, they knew bombs and blasting quite well. Yeah. Um, all you have to do is read some of the military histories of the right. 1700s, yeah. and they were blowing stuff up everywhere. <laughs> I think they decided they were going to find copper, and they just kept going inch by inch. I mean, they had some idea of where to look and what to look for. And if you look at the outside of that rock, it's not a huge surprise. But it would have been also about the time that Connecticut was giving up on copper. So they just went on to more lucrative things. I continued to dig down until I reached a layer of strange fractured rock deposited on the bedrock floor. That is when I made an interesting oh, find. Oh, that's that's nice. gold. Yeah. Metallic ore. <laughs> so I just found this on the, the very floor of the mine. So this was on the layer just above the bedrock. And it was, uh, it, it, it may have uh, broke when I, was, when I was digging and you could see the, the, the gold and silver color on the inside. So this was the ore that they were looking for. This is exactly uh, what they hope to find. Yes. Now we need to have the ore analyzed to find out what the miners had actually found. Jeff and I brought the samples to John Pulowski at the Connecticut Mining Museum. What I'd like to do is to break a sample and see if there's some, uh, some copper ore in a fresh sample. That's an excellent specimen. Okay, take a look at that specimen. Notice the wow. weighted, weighted crystals? Yeah. Be a mineral called hemimorphite. which is extremely rare in Connecticut, but very common in the Southwest. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna say a lot of these green bubbles is either pompelliite or seladonite, and okay. not copper. Okay. It definitely looks like malachite, but it's not in association with any of the co copper ore. The black, Possibly chalcosite, which is a copper sulfide. Chalcopyrite, there's your primary sulfide. The green is, is probably malachite. There's also a bit of blue. This is probably what led them to mine the, the site. Um, okay, now that one is interesting. Oh, there's definitely malachite in this. Definitely um, either chalcopyrite or pyrite. Probably chalcopyrite. Well, the brownish mineral is probably limonite, which is a breakdown of the iron sulfide. So definitely copper present. We have our copper ore minerals, chalcopyrite, chalcosite, bornite, malachite, and azurite, as well as the gang mineral, calcite. Judging from what I have observed, definitely copper, but I don't think it was that valuable to pursue. 
it's it's difficult during that time period to tell um, how valuable a mine is until you actually explore the rock itself. So they had to, to go in to see whether or not they could hit something of, of value. Well, but for the most part, uh, it's pursuing a dream. You know, you're in a new, new world um, where most of your supplies come from the mother country and uh, you want to become as independent as possible. Um, so you, you, you go in and you mine and, and hope that you hit it big. So they, I guess they did. But how did the miners know to look for it here? What tipped them off to its presence? Uh, my name is Jeremy Zolan. Um, I'm a local mineral collector and amateur scientist, and um, I'm very interested in looking at local New England geology and trying to identify new minerals previously not identified by science in our region. So on the floor of the mine, we were able to locate the uh, copper ore that the uh, colonial miners presumably were gathering, and the uh, ore, the mineral that they were going after was the mineral chalcopyrite. As you can see, there is brassy golden material in the sample. I think what they must have seen is the, uh, the rock itself um, is very rapidly weathering. It has a yellow color and a sulfurous smell to it. And um, a lot of early miners must have drawn the conclusion that when they find a lot of sulfur or sulfurous smelling rocks, that metals come with that. So they must have observed these sulfurous weathering rocks on the side of this riverbank and just decided to mine it. Maybe they saw a little bit of chalcopyrite or some green copper staining, and that was their clue. I think they were very excited because copper is a pretty valuable metal, and uh, they definitely found chunks that were better than what I have. This is what they left behind. So I imagine they were probably getting at least some kind of solid mass of this material from a large vein, and they saw it as dollar signs. They saw money coming out of this hill. But as you can see, the shaft is not that deep, and they stopped pretty quickly, so it must have not been that profitable. I think that they knew what they were doing somewhat, but they definitely were trying to chase some sort of luck as well. Um, they did not understand a lot of uh, concepts that uh, modern mining companies use to locate ores, but it seems like they did know the basics. Like they knew that this ore contained copper and that there was enough of it that it warranted some sort of exploration. So I think that it wasn't a total shot in the dark but they also weren't experts on geology either compared to our recent scientific knowledge. So the fact that they found not one, but several veins of the chalcopyrite probably got them excited enough that they wanted to blow the top off of this hill and get into some bigger uh, chalcopyrite or sulfide pod. And that's what they were excited about, but we can tell that not much rock was removed and there had to have been a reason that it was abandoned quickly. I finally put together a picture of the history of the mine. During the early 1600s, the colony of Connecticut would have looked like this, virgin and untouched. The search for precious metals in 17th century America began to fade as farming proved to be the most profitable venture. Winthrop's mines of the 1600s were nowhere near as profitable as a large farm. Vast tracts of land were available, ensuring that the farmer could produce a surplus and have a high standard of living. But there was a flaw to this system. Landowners would split their land among their heirs. This meant that each generation would have less land and therefore a lower standard of living. By the early 1700s, any and all avenues of income were explored and exploited. And mining ventures began to pop up all over the colonies. The investors were usually well-to-do local residents. In the case of Simsbury and Wallingford, skilled miners were brought from England and Germany to work the mines. This was probably true of Woodbury as well. The scene in the Woodbury mine in the 1730s would have looked like this. It is early morning. A miner has just returned to the tunnel 
he has been driving over the past few months. He has driven the tunnel into the hillside and has just intersected a vein of copper ore. He lights a candle and begins his work. The miner is sampling the ore. He needs to make a decision. Should he begin mining the vein? Or search farther down the stream bed for a possibly richer vein? The quality of the ore he has found is adequate. It will bring a decent price when shipped to the refiners in England. He gathers up his set of tools and resumes his work. He is drilling a series of three foot deep holes into the ore. His tools are simple but effective. His drill is made of steel. The end is forged to a chisel edge and hardened. As he strikes the drill with his hammer, a tiny amount of rock is chipped away. With each blow, he rotates the drill a fraction of a turn and then strikes again. After one full rotation, a circular depression is left in the ore. After thousands of repetitions, a hole is created. As he bores deeper into the rock, he uses a mud spoon to remove rock dust from the hole. Once the hole is cleared, he resumes drilling. The miner is nearly finished drilling the hole. Soon he will use a dangerous but effective technique to remove this section of ore. Blasting. The concept of using tightly contained gunpowder to fracture rock became prevalent in Central Europe around 1680. The practice was likely brought to America by the German and English miners who mined copper in Simsbury and Wallingford. Blasting has been a mainstay of hard rock mining since. The miner has carefully measured the black powder and has wrapped the charge so it is just smaller than the one inch hole he has drilled. He inserts the charge into the hole and plugs the end with clay to create back pressure. He lights the fuse, calmly walks out of the tunnel and waits to hear the boom of shattering rock. It is in this way that the mine was worked, one firing of a blast at a time. The short tunnel that remains represents many man hours of labor. Labor that had one singular goal, remove the ore that has been imprisoned in rock for millions of years. Remove it as quickly and cheaply as possible. After the smoke clears, the miner walks back into the mine. The blast was very effective. He takes a look at the shattered rock on the floor. He sees the glimmering, brassy, metallic sheen of copper ore.
the precious ore is removed from the mine. But excitement soon fades as it is realized that the vein has been depleted, and it is finally abandoned for good. In a 1748 Board of Trade report, copper mines were deemed to be unprofitable to work. It was likely at or before this time that the Woodbury mine was abandoned. The American colonists were not content to be subsistence farmers. It was because of this desire that by the beginning of the 18th century, they were looking into new ways of making money. They wanted industry, and the Woodbury mine is a good example. So what would you say was the most exciting moment of the project? Finding ore, you know? I mean, um, having um, people who knew what they were looking at break rocks and say, wow, I'm very happy with all the people who came on board to help. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy about that. Well, I mean, I think that it's part of Connecticut history, um, it's part of mining history, um, it's part of the history of this town, and it's part of the early history of this town. So I think it's worthwhile sharing that. These experiments in mining helped foster an environment in which less than a century later, the Industrial Revolution could flourish and marked the beginning of the American entrepreneurial spirit that would characterize our modern industrial world. <laughs>